podcast with Josh and Demetrius. On the line, we've got Demetrius, that's me, Demetrius Gelatis, and Josh Verbal. What's going on, Josh? <laughs> Not much, Demi. MN Pool Bootcamp, bro. Yeah, yeah. MN, I'm sorry. MN Pool Bootcamp. Demetrius here with MN Pool Bootcamp, making dreams come into realities for like days and days now. Okay, <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, let's see. Okay. So I had, somebody was asking about like, well, who is this person you're with? Apparently they were like, tell us more about Josh. And so I want to just mention that we did a good, uh, interview introducing you and, and telling people a little bit about you. And that is in the Q it up podcast archives. Uh, but, uh, I just say that Josh has been my road partner. He's a, uh, he plays out of Minnesota along with me and, uh, we go to tournaments and we play pool and run balls. And, you know, he's a, he's a great player. And, uh, but, you know, we just, that's, I don't know. I, so I, I guess I would check it for people that are more curious about Josh's background, please check out that episode. Otherwise just know that he plays, uh, he plays on snooker tables and misses like, you know, every, you know, every couple months. So that's take his, take his words with some weight. So that's all I can say. <laughs> that sounds, that's, that's, that's fair. I, uh, yeah, that, that podcast that we did with the, with the first one we did together, like where we talked about my background, that's very extensive. It covers everything from like start to start to finish soup to nuts. So yeah. A to Z. All right. So, uh, just a quick outline for the pod today, we've got a quick intro. We're going to just talk a little bit about what we've been working on, what we've got upcoming. Then, uh, we've got two good listener questions. I've also got a letter that I want to kind of share that I thought was a pretty, uh, uh, pretty interesting. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a letter from a listener that kind of talks about what different types of instruction are out there. Uh, so I'm going to cover that, a couple of listener questions, and then we've got a discussion topic today that I wanted to cover. This has been on my heart because it's something that all of my students that come train with me are, are really, this is, everybody needs to know about this and kind of think about this, which is how to view bad days. So that's going to be our discussion topic is, is when you're playing rough. So without further ado, uh, I want to kind of get into the intro. So Josh, uh, I think you mentioned maybe last podcast, but I'm not sure. Did we talk about the Beloit tournament, uh, what you're doing to prepare? What, when is that? Tell, why don't you tell us what you got going on with pool? Oh yeah. The, the, uh, there's the, the, the Larry, ne- uh, Larry Neville, um, there's like a benefit series of tournaments there that are, that's on the weekend of, I think it's like the April 16th or 17th. I think it's just a one day thing where they have a, a bar table tournament and they have a big table 10 ball tournament where it's like, might be limited to 16 players. And, and uh, yeah, so it's cool. Like I, I play like exclusively big table. So this is a great opportunity to go out there and just signed up for it and kind of getting ready for it. And I've been busy, busy, busy with work. Like, like my, my side hustle in life, which is, work and family um and i got this elaborate side hustle where i'm like i got like three kids a wife and like this business that just you know takes up all my time but uh yeah that's my side hustle and then pool is my my main thing <laughs> trying to trying to snap off hundreds of dollars here and there playing playing against champions so um so yeah so i've just been practicing and, and drilling at home and playing ghost and doing some drills and stuff so kind of getting ready for it and I'm, I'm in a spot now where it's like I, I put in a lot of work in the last three to six months and, and, and I'm, I'm pretty okay where I'm playing. And uh, I just am giving myself a little bit of time to hit balls as, as much as I can. And then prior to the, to the tournament, I'll just ramp up, ramp up, ramp up and be ready to roll when I get there. So, yeah. Yeah. And I know, and we've talked, of course, so, you know, Josh and I talk not every day, but we talk quite a bit. And so I, I get to know more about behind the scenes of, you know, what he's done to prepare. He's, we actually talked about that a lot in our last episode about how to practice. And, and, and we talked a lot about what we practice. So for those that want to hear uh, more about how he's prepared and what kind of work he's put in, in the last three to six months, I think we covered a lot of that there. So yeah, uh, same with me. I've got, you know, I've been training, you know, I've had boot camps. Um, so I do the three day boot camps. I might as well work that in. Um, uh, this, you know, for listeners, I don't want anyone to think that it's limited to people in Minnesota. It's called Minnesota Pool Boot Camp, uh, but I because it's three days and because we're doing advanced training, the majority of my students fly in. So if you live in Florida or California or you know whatever, uh, don't don't think that you know the plane tickets are real cheap with COVID right now. So there's no reason uh, 
the geography should be an issue. But anyway, I do a three day training and that's been going really well. I appreciate those uh, for reaching out to me. It's always exciting to share, um, share pool with people that are passionate enough to come dedicate, uh, you know, to put it on their calendar and make it an event. And, and I've had uh, boot camps each week and for the next, I don't know, seven eight weeks in a row, I've got a boot camp lined up. So it's going to be very good. So point is, I've been busy too, training, training, training. And then what that means is that I haven't had, you know, it's not like I just get to wake up every day and train pool all day. So I don't have a lot of time. My, my big event is the, uh, I've got this battle of the sexes, which is a uh, virtual tournament that queued up uh, network is running Nate Mindham. Uh, it is going to be a virtual tournament with top players and it's men and women. And the format is going to be, that the men are going to be playing 10 ball ghost and the women are going to be playing nine ball ghost. And so if I compete against, you know, a woman uh, pro then she'll be playing nine ball ghost, I'll be playing 10 ball ghost and it's going to be whoever scores the most uh, off their break. And so that's going to be a tough format uh, because there's, <laughs> that means, that means all the men are going to be better than me. And then most of the women are better than me. And then a couple of women that aren't maybe better than me, are playing nine ball with a magic rack and a dead, dead ball. So that basically means I'm the dead buddy in the field. But uh, what am I doing to prepare? I am, uh, I've got two days that are like before that tournament. I'll have my kids, but I'm going to be just really, I've got my break going pretty well in terms of the hit, but in terms of like my tables plays tough and the balls don't always track in as easily. And so I'm going to be just putting in probably two to four hours uh, of breaking and then a couple of drills I like to do to really get my arms swinging, you know, powerfully and straight. Uh, and I'll be doing, and then running some tables, you know, so it'll be like breaking for an hour and then, and then drilling for an hour and then playing the goals for a couple hours. I'll probably do that, you know, the two days before, and then hope that that's enough to, that's not going to be enough to grow and improve, but hopefully that's enough to warm up and, and, and kind of be prepared at least. Very good. Uh, Anything else, or should we just get right into uh, the letter? Yeah, yeah. What, and so what's the letter? It's about uh, well, different yeah. kind of instructors and things. Well, I thought this was a – so I hear stories like this a lot, and I just – I wanted to share this. Uh, it was kind of a heartfelt email that this gentleman sent me. And so he was actually uh, – he actually came out and trained, trained with me, and this is what he sent me before he came out. So he says – and I'm going to change, I'm going to take out any names. I don't, my, my point is not to name different instructors. My point is just to tell the story. It says, basically, he talked about how he learned to play as a kid and his friend and his dad, his friend's dad kind of taught him pool, but they didn't teach him the right way. And he was always recreational. And then anyway, he's getting, you know, now that life has opened up, the story starts, this letter, I'm going to start the letter where he kind of like starts taking it up more seriously now that he's an adult and he's got time in his life. He says, I met somebody that was playing a pool league. I decided to join the local APA within the first few batches. I went from six to seven. Then after about six months, I went from a seven to an eight. I've been at that same level ever since. I think it was about 2015 when I started league. So I hit a point and it did not seem I could get better. So I decided to take a lesson. I went to, and I'll just say it's, you know, uh, reputable. Redacted. Yeah, 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 redacted, reputable billiard instructor in 2017. I drove there, took a two-day lesson. He basically changed all my fundamentals. Most of my training was shooting a cue ball the full length of the table and trying to make the cue ball come back and hit my cue stick. I was doing this after he'd positioned me in the correct position. We did other things, but not as deep or as much as I wanted, mostly drilling on that one drill. I did not shoot good for a while. However, he said that that would be the case, but then I would get better. I did not get better. I struggled with fundamentals. Every time I shoot bad, even to this day, I'm struggling with what, uh, with, it's a typo, I'm struggling with what is my fundamentals. Is it my grip, my stroke, my alignment? That was what he told me. Bad shooting was from bad fundamentals. This has really stuck with me and caused me a lot of discouragement. So in 2019, I went to see another notable billiard instructor. He changed my grip and stance from what the first instructor told me. So I worked on that for a year. 
in 2020, I worked with, insert, top player. He was the player I most admired when younger. I loved to watch him play. I also loved the way he was so professional and respectful. He mentioned I was taking the cue down through the cue ball when shooting topspin and not getting full spin. So I tweaked my grip and fundamentals again. He had me set up a stop shot, follow shot, draw shot across the, tail, trail, uh, across the table and drill on that. Well, recently I made up my mind to stop focusing on fundamentals and get to shooting. I have lost the fun of the game that had and gotten so worried about fundamentals that I almost wanted to stop playing. Like I said, every time I play bad, I think it's my fundamentals and I, I started thinking I need to tweak something. I would like you to look at my fundamentals and let me know if you see anything. If you do, I'll correct it. If not, please say, okay, you're good. However, I've seen a lot of other players with crazy fundamentals that shoot very, very well. So I think it's like you said, fundamentals are important, but they don't drive the final performance. You have to develop your skill. This really hits home with me as I want to get away from worrying about fundamentals and focus on playing better. I just would love you to break down my game and tell you where I need to improve. I will give it my best. And I really like what you said about the continuing uh, training through your Facebook group and keeping in touch so you can continue to coach me, not just once, but keep it going. I think that would be a huge help also. So that's that's uh, that's an excerpt from the letter. Uh, he signs off after that. But basically just kind of telling a story. And Josh, the reason I wanted to read this, I've heard this story from a lot of my students. And I've had... I've had a lot of people share that they just like, it's kind of killing their love for the game and that they just, they just feel kind of like gobbledygook because they're always, they don't even have a baseline anymore. They're just making changes and changes and trying to find the right setup because they just think that that's the answer. And it was kind of heartbreaking. So what, what do you think when you hear that story? What, what's your reaction? Demi, my reaction is the two inch death punch. So I, so I had a barber, like I rented space to a guy and he was a barber and the guy was like, I don't know, 60 some years old. And he told me, I can do a two inch death punch. I, I could, I could <laughs> kill somebody with a two inch death punch. So I was, I'm like, oh. I was telling you, when you said two inch, death, two inch death punch, I was very hooked. I'm like, that might be, that might be what we have to title this episode because that is <laughs> Like legitimately, if that doesn't hook people to listen, then I don't want them as an audience member. <laughs> exactly. So, okay, so, exactly. So the so, guy stares you in the eye and says he can do a two inch, a two inch death punch. Two oh. inch death punch. I could, I could stand two inches. I could start two inches away from you. I could kill you with my bare hands with a punch. And so I'm like, okay. So, so here's my point, Demi. Like I'm an, I'm like an interested in MMA guy. Like I, I just like I'm a shit eating wild man for MMA content and stuff. And I like watching fights and training. And so, a- MMA to me is like effective fighting and so through through like the years of like kung fu and like you know taekwondo and all these things like some of those elements can come into you know current mma fighters that are at the top of the food chain but but like the two inch death punch guy like that's like some like shaolin like master on a mountain kind of thing that's just sort of in the movies and sort of in people's minds and it's kind of not effective and it's kind of phony baloney and so I, that's, that's what I was thinking about when you were talking. And so I just want to share that. It's like, what's effective is learning all the skills associated with like tearing someone to shreds. If you're talking about fighting and it's not about standing there and, and hitting a, a board from two inches away and, and visualizing your hand going through concrete, you know, and over a 20 year span and just working on your, your two inch death punch fundamentals. And so I don't know if that makes any sense or it's gobbledygook, but that's what I think. I, I think it reminds me of like, of like snake oil and kind of ineffective systems that people are trying to pitch and sell. And so that, that's what I feel like you asked me. So I'm telling you, when, when, when I look at all these aiming systems and all this stuff, that's what I think about someone in a strip mall trying to teach some kid how to like, you know, with through some BS narrative that he's going to be able to like punch someone from two inches away and kill them with their bare hands and then like collect the money and then just keep having them hit the board for 20 years and collect the money. That. That's it, man. I, I, that's it. So, you, you know, it kind of, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like there's the ordinary and then there's the superhuman. So like the ordinary way of doing martial arts would be to go to like some type of, you know, martial arts or jujitsu or some type of martial arts training, and then just be one of everybody else that learns how to kick and punch and then spars and gets beat and puts it together and squares off day after day with, you know, tougher opponents and gradually builds up their muscles and their technique and their resilience and their, you know, strategy and their, 
whatever. But then there's the people that are like, well, that's what everybody else does. There's got to be like the way where I could be wearing the, you know, the orange robes and working with some guy that shows me some, some secret where, you know, everybody, like, I'm not going to do it every other way. I'm going to do it with this, this kind of like, it's like this um, kind of this, I don't know, grandiose narrative. That's what, that's like, that's what, when I hear two inch death bunch, I just like a very grandiose narrative. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, and I feel like that's with fundamentals. Like everybody else just gets up and shoots balls in the hole and tries to win. But I am going to cultivate this two inch stroke of death, which just goes automatically <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah. where I'm looking and it's never going to miss. And then everybody else, yeah. you know, my, and, and my dad was like that. And I love my dad very, very, very much, but he was like that. He was like over the top kind of grandiose in some ways. And he told me about this, uh, this, uh, he always talked about this. There was this uh, archery school in, in Japan where the students for the first year, they never actually touched an arrow for the first year of training. They just held the bow. And he was like, he just found something about that. Like, that is how it's done. Like, you work on how you hold the bow for a year. You earn the right with how you hold the bow. Once you hold the bow, world class, then you touch your arrow. And there was something really, there is something kind of compelling about that narrative. Because you hear that, you're like, yes, perfection, transcendence. That sounds awesome. But when you look at how players actually play well, it's like, just kind of gritty. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't know. Yeah. What, what do you, what's your, what I, do you think? I, I think it's balanced, man. Like it's a little, it's like, I don't want to like dismiss like, like super focus, like, like you're seeing with your dad with the arrows and the bow. And it's like, yeah, like you, you need to have that much dedication and that much patience. And like, that's, that's, and I really like look to Japanese culture with a lot of like, they like respect and like, you know, Euro Jiro with the sushi that, 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 the guy with the uh, he just makes rice for like two or three years. I don't remember the documentary. It's on Netflix, but like the guy's like one of the, you know, 2000 plate sushi guy in, at, eventually, but he starts off just making rice for like years and years and years. Um, and so like, there's something like admirable and wonderful about that dedication and that, that, that thing. Um, but, but I just think effectiveness, man, like, like, like I think it has to be balanced. If, if it gets too far out of balance, like people, will use this perfectionistic and like narrative and they'll, they'll keep them from moving forward. That, that's what I like for fundamentals, like it, fundamentals trips people up where they think I don't have like, oh, I don't have perfect fundamentals. And so I either need to go on this search through this mountain, you know, shaman guy to find the perfect fundamentals and then I'll come together or, um, or else I just, I shouldn't even do it. You know, I just, I'll never get there. And meanwhile, we talked about it last episode too. It's just like, it just keeps you from moving forward. And I, I think, I think it's both, man. I think you got to be focused and really willing to put in the work, but you got to be willing to put in the work without getting too tripped up in, you know, it has to be done perfectly or it has to be this perfect system. And you got to be a, like, we're talking about instructors. So I'll just get back on point. You got to be really like aware of like, who you're going to for instruction and if they're if they're it's just it's hard man because you're if you're out there trying to get better and some guy is a good player he's telling you to do this it could get really trappy right where you're like well I'll just do what he says but i don't know man it's just it's hard it's hard well, I, to, to sort hear, it out but when it comes to balance here's what i think it's like there's what i don't like is when people go off on their own too far afield so there is a path there is an established path towards great pool it's like there's a path up a mountain and that path does involve developing your fundamentals and it does involve a lot of training and it does involve a lot of competition and it involves a lot of loss and it involves a lot of, you know, just sparring and, and fighting and tournaments and competition and all that. So that's the path and fundamentals is part of that path, but that path is kind of mainstream and it's heavily traveled. Okay. The reason it's heavily traveled is because it's, effective and that's and it's hard it's a hard path and what happens is people veer off on these solo paths that aren't effective and they veer off because they think that they have a better understanding of how, what the pool journey is or they have a misunderstanding of what the pool journey is and i think i think when people think like it's pool is developing your your fundamentals until perfection that's a that's a cool narrative bro and and that narrative can be entertaining but it doesn't lead 
it, it just, it's a, it's not a, it's not a rewarding, healthy, effective journey. If it was, that's exactly the road that all the top players follow. And it's like, no top players get to be top players because they're competing against top players and getting in the ring and getting beat up and then putting the pieces back together a little bit by a little bit, like by a little bit more effectively and fundamentals is part of that, but it's not this. So I, I just feel like when people, when people want to be superior to everybody else on the road and be like the wise, smart one, that's going to find their own path. And then they veer off the road. It, it just either they're veering off the road because they just, it's a, it's a cool narrative and they just get to play the superhero role in their mind. And they get to feel like I'm on a special journey. Look at me. I'm so smart. I'm smarter than everybody else. Or they veer off the road because the actual road itself is so hard that they're just going to talk themselves into, I'm going to go down this road where I practice in my basement forever and work on my stroke because that's a lot easier than having to actually follow this road that involves getting my teeth kicked in by good players all the time. And so I'll just hide from the actual hard road because it's actually too hard or because I want to be different and better in my own mind. That's what I think it is, man. Damn, I agree a thousand percent, man. I I really think that's what it is. I do. I, I I think that it's very, very hard to get your teeth kicked in and to go out there and be a street fighter and just continually, you know, continually like work on your fundamentals a little bit, work on your game a lot of bit, and then go run it and see what happens. And then and then get your teeth kicked in and then go back and, and work harder, 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 and then try it again and try it again. That's a that's a really difficult process. It's a very painful process and very like, it's filled with a lot of doubt and a lot of like, like failure and, and toughness, tough, tough situations. And I just, I think it's easier to say, I'm going to stroke into a Coke bottle or I'm going to hit the ball against the rail and try to have it hit my cue for, you know, it's easier for the instructor to show that because that's like a concrete thing that he thinks he's bringing value. But, but, but it's like, it's hard to explain to a person, no man, like there's, there's like, a finite amount of skills that you got to develop and practice and train. And then you got to go test it in competition and then just keep rinse, repeat that for years. You know, I think it's, Not yeah, like, I think it's a fear thing. We've talked about needing to lose and how hard it is. And I talked about how loss, the, the, the road to success is paved with failure. And I think people that stroke into a Coke bottle, I think they think that if they just stroke into a Coke bottle long enough, then they'll just, transcend and become the guy that wins all the time and that they can somehow like detour around and bypass all the pain and loss and suffering and that's actually the opposite like the quickest way to get good is through loss and pain and suffering because that's where you grow and so so hiding behind fundamental like i'm gonna just work on my fundamentals in a basement until i'm a perfect pro perfect product and then i don't have to risk loss it's like that's completely backwards and i think that that's yeah 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 i'm glad we talked about this and so i would say that there's when I, when I thought about it, we've talked about it. So I just wanted to share it was we talked about it and it's, we think that there's like three it's types of instructors. There's the fundamental people that are like, you know, stroke into a Coke bottle until you're perfect. There are the, the top name pros that do like exhibition type instruction where it's like, you get to spend money to hang out with a world champion for a few hours and they'll tell you road stories and show you trick shots. And then you get to like have rubbed elbows with so-and-so. And then there's like the actual people that like train pool. And I'm not the only one. There's some people I was talking to you about. Like I know some people that are actually just down and dirty that are really engaged that care about what they do, where when they work with somebody, you know, maybe they'll touch on fundamentals, but they're also looking at, you know, where that person's at in terms of tip accuracy and where that person's at in terms of patterns and where that person's at in terms of strike. And they, and they could zero in on weak parts of the game and help guide them into, into better stuff. And so I just feel like that's what you get. So for people that are in the lesson market or instruction market, just understand those are your options. You can get somebody that's going to put tape on the floor where you practice, where you point your toe for two days. You can get people that are going to sit there and show you trick shots and tell you road stories and you get to hang out with, you know, some name player that you've seen on magazines since you were a kid. Or you can work with somebody that's going to help you break down your game and develop it. Uh, so that's, that's it. it. And I just think to break down your game and develop it is the, is the most effective path and, and kind of the path that I would just say is, is the only one that's going to work that, you know, like the, I've been around the aiming system guys, like we know one or, or a few, and I'm not, you know, we know many, I mean, whatever, but like, <laughs> <laughs> I just, like, I had a chance to go play with an aiming system guy and he came to my house and the immediately what he tried to do was show me his aiming system. I didn't ask. I wasn't interested. I, I, uh, you know, I, I run out racks and racks on snooker tables. Like I feel like my aim is not my problem. Um, I've got other problems, trust me, like plenty and other leaks, 
but it's just like, you just got to be careful, man. Like that's all I'm trying to share with, with the listeners and people that are trying to get better and, and that are out there and then looking for instruction. Like you got to be really protective of your game and of who is in your kitchen and in your, in your head and, and telling you things. And you got to look at their motivations and you just got to be super careful. That's it. That's it. And that's it. And Neil's fan has a video about aiming system, like LOL aiming systems, you know, and he's, he's a top player in, in the history of pool, like the guy's a hall of famer. And it's like, I don't know. I just would encourage people to just relax on that kind of stuff, man. And, and yeah, go yeah, towards what you're talking about, Demi, the, the overall development of your game and skill set. Yeah, a Neil's fan basically did a video for uh, the recap, and he basically said, I'm going to answer all the questions about aiming systems and all the sighting stuff. He says, I am going to free up a lot of room in your head. I used ghost ball to kind of get an idea of where my cue ball needs to be. I understand that if I use side spin, uh, there's going to be a lot of adjustments. You have to practice it until you can feel it. There's no system that's going to work real well. Now, that's going to be controversial. I'm going to get a lot of emails. But this is just I'm, – I'm not, I'm not – I'm just telling you what Neil said. Neil's is like, basically – you have to hit it until you can feel it and put it in the hole. And the aiming system I use now, I'm not saying that there's not any value in any aiming systems. That's not what I'm saying. I'm telling you that I'm telling you simply what Niels, what me and what Josh subscribe to, which is I subscribe to the put it in the hole system. And there's the best video on YouTube. It's like this two, two, three minute video. It's uh, if you look up on YouTube pool aiming, put it in the hole. Uh, yeah, that the guy, guy that does yeah. the, the put it in the hole aiming system. What aiming system are you using? Uh, put it in the hole. You know, the guy's just basically he just, just slams the ball your, in the hole. Yeah. Yeah. You pull your, you get down, you pull your cue back, you put it in the hole. And he's like, if you remember, if you're not put it in the hole, you're not doing it right. <laughs> it's like, anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, okay. So we're on the same page there. And excellent. Excellent. But I think that was super valuable because I think a lot of people are trapped on that road. So, okay. Um, listener questions. Josh. Where, where do you look last on a jump shot? Do you look at the cue ball, the object ball? What do you, what do you do? You know what, I mean, I, I just, I got to pass. I, I, I just, <laughs> I'm not like, I'm not, like, I'm not like super into jump shots. I've been getting better at it because you gave me a tip about where to look. And it's like, I don't know if it's helping or not helping. I don't know if it's, if it's like eye patterns and all that stuff. I, I can't, I just, I'm too organic, man. Like I just don't, it almost comes into some sort of system, you know, and it's like, I'll just leave it to you. Like, I, I don't know. I, I don't know where I look. Just, I just, just jump and try hole. to make it. Yeah. I just try to put in the hole. Like I have like with jumping, the one thing I have been doing is like, I have been like setting up and visualizing and make, you know, getting my, my jump cue going straight at the spot that I want to go like visually like air bridge kind of. So I've been setting up and then I've just been, uh, um, you know, this is going to be the stupidest tip, like tip in the world. But like about, about a month or two ago, I just determined that I'm just going to, I'm just going to be a good jumper. I'm just going to jump. I'm just going to like, when I get to the ball, instead of thinking jump cues are stupid and Earl, you know, why are we using this tiny piece of wood? LOL. Like, cause I don't like jump cues. I wish they were outlawed. But instead of that, I'm like, well, everyone uses jump cues. So my, my tip or my thing on jump cues that's worked for me recently is just to go up there and say you know what screw it I'm a good jumper and, and and it's like I haven't practiced jumping anymore I haven't done anything I've I've I've, I've tried to do what you said which was the tip that you're going to share I think um but overall my overall meta strategy with jumping is just I tell myself and believe that I'm an effective jumper and I just visualize it and then I line up try to get straight on it and then I just like execute and i've been jumping really really well so i don't know if that's it man probably not worth anything to anybody but that's what i've been doing well i think that's that speaks volumes to like mindset and visualization is probably more important than technique and i i really agree uh i think with jumps in there's a lot we could talk about with jumps uh the tip i think you're talking about is really being focused on tip accuracy with you know going through uh, where you're hitting the cue ball is very important in terms of you don't want the thing arcing and deflecting and curving down the table. But, yeah. but what I would say is I've, I've experimented and I will tell you, there's been three answers. Uh, you know, some people, when you're shooting a very flat long jump where it's like a small elevation, uh, low elevation, longer jumps, sometimes you can look at the object ball, just like any other, you know, half elevated shot. If you have more extreme elevation, you know, you're doing a full ball jump that's closer where you're, you know, your body is, 
really, you know, elevated. You're not, you don't have the object ball in your line of sight where you'd really have to distort and crane your neck to be able to look at the object ball. Then you look at the cue ball last. Uh, now there's uh, the blade of grass idea. Uh, that's a, comes from golf, which is when you're putting, you can't necessarily see the hole when you're hitting the golf ball. So what you do is you pick a blade of grass that's on the line towards the hole and you aim at that blade of grass, which is actually in your vision center. So for example, I know some people when they're jumping, if they're jumping long distance, but they're jumping over a ball that's a foot away. So they're very elevated. They can't see the object ball. They might aim at the object ball down and then they'll look at a point on the object ball that they're jumping over that's on the line to the ball that they want to pocket. And then when they're elevate, they can't see their target ball, but they can see the obstruction ball. And they're actually looking at the point on the obstruction ball that's on the right path. And they're trying to drive their tip through that. So those are the three answers, object ball, cue ball, or blade of grass, something on the route to the object ball. For me, I would say if it's a level, level jump, like not too much elevation, I'll usually look at the object ball. If it's a steeper jump, I'm looking at the cue ball. But the real answer is what Josh said. And I mean it. The real answer is that the feel of the shot is much, much, much more important than where your eyes are looking. And so when you, I would say you make the jump shot in your mind and getting on the ball. And once you, in your mind, picture the shot and feel the shot and set up on the shot, at that point, you can close your eyes and make the jump. And that's better. What I found, one of the biggest breakthroughs I've had on my jumps is that when I get down on the jump shot, if everything looks wacky. So like, in other words, if I start making a, it actually, to me, sometimes it doesn't even look like I'm hitting center ball. It looks like I'm hitting with a little right spin sometimes once I elevate. Uh, but I know that's the center. And if I start making adjustments once I'm down on the shot based on information that my eyes are feeding me, it goes haywire and I lose my feel and it doesn't work. But if I look at the shot standing up, I set up on the ball, right. And I just trust that the feel I had and the way I set up on the ball and I lock that feel in, then I just trust that it's all right and deliver my cue. And I can legitimately do that closing my eyes at that point. So, um, which that's not just a saying, I mean, I've practiced uh, shooting jump shots with my eyes closed and my make percentage does not really change. Uh, I've even, I haven't, the only thing I haven't done is the, uh, there's an eyes closed test you could do where uh, I can do this on level shots, like straight in shots. If I've got a cross table stop shot, I can sh get down and practice stroke, close my eyes, take my cue out of my bridge hand and tap it to the floor <laughs> and then put the cue back in my bridge hand, all with my eyes closed. So you kind of like close your eyes, tap the cue to the floor, put it back in your bridge hand and then shoot and make the ball. And it's just a way to like make you lock into the feel of the shot instead of the vision of the shot. And I'm not saying that's a good way to practice. It's just an interesting test to demonstrate how much more important feel is than once you've got the feel of the shot, changing, losing the feel based on visual input is just not a good plan. Does that make sense? Yeah, man. Yeah. I'm a big feel, feel, feel guy. So yeah, I, I'm excited about what you're saying. So that's awesome. Cool. Uh, another listener question. Hang on. What was, oh, this one was interesting. Uh, this was on our uh, private Facebook training group for uh, pool bootcamp graduates. He said, uh, I saw a post about being confident on your decision-making. This has been a huge struggle for me. For years, I've been mistaking poor execution for poor pattern play. I'd hit a ball wrong and miss a three or four ball run. And I'd immediately blame my pattern choice, which domino effect lowered my confidence in decision making. I've always known that confidence is critical in pool, but up until recently, I never truly realized how much it was killing my game by not having it. So he's, he's talking about just not just confidence in general, but confidence in his decision, like feeling like, okay, this is right. Let's go. But now, and I think his, his converse, his comment was based on a post that you made about commitment. So what are your thoughts about being committed to your, your shot selection? I, yeah, it, yeah, there was a comment. Yeah. It was a reply to that original post. So my idea, Demi, it, it, is that, <clears throat> that commitment is way more important than um, having it be perfect or having it be like the correct shot in the moment, quote unquote. So what happens is you do all this training and all this practicing 
and to try to learn the correct pattern. And for me, it would be cue ball and patterns, cue ball and patterns, like shot making. I've, I've, you know, eye hand coordination, just it's not as big of a thing for me. I still practice it, of course, but like cue ball and patterns, cue ball and patterns. Well, what I ran into was years of trying to like strangle out perfect cue ball and pattern in my game and not really like knowing that when I go and compete, I need to shut off that, that struggle for perfect cue ball and pattern because what it was doing was killing my attention. It was killing my focus. And it was, and then it was killing my, um, my, uh, my commitment to the shot. Cause I was always doubting, like, I'm always like half doubting if I'm shooting the right shot. Am I shooting the right shot? Is this the right, correct pattern or cue ball? And so what I was posting about there, at, at the original post was like, you, you have to be, let all of that stuff go when, when you're out and, and going and competing and you have to, confidently move forward even if it's not correct or perfect because it's almost like your mind won't know the difference like if you if, if you can get rid of that voice that's doubting yourself doubting yourself doubting yourself you're much better off shooting a five ball pattern incorrectly with with like just complete commitment and like kind of confidence I guess you'd say than you are you know tentatively like worrying about whether or not it's correct or not and and like trying to deliver the cue with like this this doubt in your arm basically is where it creeps in so yeah does that make sense Dan? yeah yeah and i found the original post you made and uh you just you just hit it really really well this is the one where i i think i had a reply where i said yeah you know it's all about commitment i said i'm not talking about a let's give it a try and see what happens attitude you know this isn't ordering a new dish in a restaurant trying a new netflix series or taking home a foster kid. This is pool. We're talking <laughs> yeah, exactly. about we're talking about real commitment. I, I, real about, commitment. Yeah, really yeah exactly. not the foster kid. Anyway, I, okay, so that's a little throwaway line that I thought was funny. But okay, so that was awesome. so yeah. So I I 100 agree because what and I, what I said uh, in reply to this exchange was, it's almost like you've got there are it's not almost like there are two parts of the game. There's the planning, and then there's the execution. And those are two different parts. So let's just break it down and say there's two people inside of you. There's the planner and there's the shooter. And it's like they're playing a scotch doubles game with each other, where first the planner plans, then the shooter shoots. Then the planner plans, then the shooter shoots. And they're taking turns. Well, the, here's the funny part. I'm really big on cue ball and patterns. And I'm really, really a believer in studying the right way to approach the game to, you know, reduce the pressure on the shooter and on the executor however the goal is not to reduce the pressure on the shooter so that the shooter doesn't have to shoot good (laughs) because that there's no amount of planning that you can do there's no amount of billiard instructional knowledge and understanding that you can learn that's not gonna that's gonna eliminate the need to just swallow hard and make a hard shot in the heat of battle like that's not you can't outthink that what you're not, you're not training so that the shooter doesn't have to shoot. You're training so that on patterns of cue ball, so that when the shooter does shoot, your overall effectiveness increases, <laughs> you know? So mm-hmm. you're not training, you're not training so the shooter can have a day off. You're training so that when the shooter works his tail off, the overall production gets better and better. That's what you're training for. And so it's the shooter will always have to shoot and the shooter. So the, it's a very funny uh, relationship because the planner has to be like, Hey shooter, I'm going to take good care of you. I'm going to make your job easy. And then the shooter's job has got to be like, ha, 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 bro, I don't care what you leave me. I'm bombing anything in from anywhere anyway, so don't worry. Like, that's how that relationship has to work. And so when the planner's planning, the planner has to pick a route and say, hey, shooter, I'm going to look out for you. I'm going to try to get you good on this ball. I'm going to try to get you an angle. I'm going to try to leave you so you're not jacked up. But then the shooter's got to be like, all right, don't worry, man. You do your best, but whatever, wherever you put me, I'll be fine. And then after the planner plans, so that's, that's the first part is that it's like a relationship between the two. You have to have a good relationship between the two and it's about, and you have to do both, you know, that both have a role to play. You can't do one or the other. And so, and then the other thing I'd say is the baton pass. That's where the commitment comes in. It's because if the, if the pattern, if the pattern player, if the, if the uh, what are the planner, if the planner is still, is still planning when the shooter's shooting, then you, if the planner, I'll put it this way, the planner doesn't do a very good job shooting pool. The planner is not a very good pool player. So if you're planning and then you don't pass the baton to the shooter and you're still planning, 
there's no plan that will work if the planter shoots the ball. And so you have to pass the baton. And when it comes to fundamentals, the only thing I'm kind of a stickler on is I do believe that, and I hesitate, I've, I've evolved my thinking on this after working with you and talking with you, is what I mean by pre-shot routine, it's not necessarily even that much physical uh, as I've thought about it so much as the passing of the baton between the planner and the shooter and that, and that good players make a habit of picking their shot. And then there's a moment of like, all right, let's go. And they pass the baton from the, from the planner to the shooter. And then the, then their brain goes to sleep. And I, and I talk about like rhythm and I talk about like a routine where you do it the same way every time. And there's actually some like hypnosis type stuff kind of where you can like, every time I do this maneuver, every time I take this airstroke, my mind goes to sleep, I go down and shoot. My mind goes to sleep, I go down and shoot. So you're thinking and planning and thinking and planning. You pick a shot, you do your pre-shot, your mind is like, you're teaching your brain that once you do this, that's a sign that I'm passing the baton to the shooter. I'm going with this shot. And at this point, Right and wrong stops mattering. The planner's job is done. Now it's the shooter's job, and the shooter's job is to shoot. And so that that's what matters. So I, I just think of it that way. I think that commitment is a critical, and that, and that what commitment means is passing the baton to the shooter. Yep. And then, okay, Are you, one more thing on commitment. Yeah, yeah. Just, just on practicing, and we've talked about this. I feel like I'm going over the same stuff over and over. So sorry if I am, but I just think that having commitment to playing and getting, getting your work in and not like, that's, that's another thing is like, and we could talk about it. I'll, I'll, I'll wait for bottom of the range. It'll, it'll get covered there, but just, just, I think there's a commitment and a, and that, that builds more of a belief and a confidence with, with your overall meta strategy of trying to get better. So We'll, I'll, I'll, we talk about it later, but yep. Okay. Uh, so yeah, we'll move into our discussion topic, which is something that, like I said, uh, this has to do with how we deal with playing poorly or how we look at playing poorly. Now I want to say this is not meant to necessarily be how to get out of a slump. This is not necessarily meant to be what to do when you're playing bad, like how to turn it around or how to win when you're playing bad. That's not, that's not my topic is, playing out of playing out of it or turning it around. That's not really like, or what to do strategically. I want to specifically talk about how we view playing bad. Uh, and I, and I think that there's a difference between those questions. And I think there's an important understanding of how we look at playing bad and why that's important. And so you mentioned the bottom of your range. Everybody has a range. We have good days. We have bad days. So if, if somebody is a 600 Fargo rate player, they might have days where they play 500. They might have days where they play 700. Uh, most of the time they're playing 480 to, I'm sorry, 580 to 620. So, I mean, that's, that's just a bell curve distribution of good and bad days. That is the reality. That is exactly how that works. So if you play 100 pool sessions, you're going to play average 60% of the time. And 20% of the time you're going to play well. And 20% of the time you're going to play poorly. That's... That's what you're signing up for as a pool player. And I, I guess I feel like people don't, you know, that's, that's the reality, but people either they, it's like, they don't either, they don't understand that or they, they feel like upset and betrayed that that's the reality uh, where it's like, they just don't, it's like, it's weird to me, Josh. It's weird to me. Like how, how is it that people who have been playing pool for 20 or 30 years still get surprised and frustrated when they have bad days. Like at what point do you not learn that that's like what pool is? How, how come that, how come that's not self-evident, Josh? Uh, it's interesting, man. I, I think, I think that like a lot of people growing up in America have watched movies of a lot of like, hero stories you know like you practice you practice and then you win you know and it's like i think that then also there's like kind of like the high school football mentality which is like i'm gonna practice 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 and then i'm gonna win you know and it's like they're not really focusing on mastery and process they're focusing on results and so i think that people are snagged through our maybe through culture and through upbringing and through you know 
where we're at that they get snagged into results instead of mastery. And so they just always want to be at the top of their range because that's what they've been shown in their life. You know, that's the way it's supposed to go when they're watching highlights of things. And then that's what they think is supposed to happen. And then because they're focused on the result, they just always want the result to be there, the highest part of their range to be the result of what's going on, you know? And yeah, yeah I think there's it. two parts, two parts of that. You're right, Josh, you're right. That's uh, the, you know, the, the movie culture It's So if you look at the story arc of every movie for sports ever, it always starts with, you know, the misfit outcast down on his luck, not very effective, getting pushed around, bullied, you know, people are making fun of him. You know, it's like, I mean, everything from, you know, Rudolph the red nosed reindeer to the, I mean, it's not just sports, right? Every movie arc ever starts with a character who's not doing too well. And then usually the antagonist is usually like some really dominant, intimidating, you know, kind of like there is no mercy in this dojo, sweep the knee kind of like big, t- bigger, stronger David Goliath. I mean, I, this is like, as I'm getting my head around it, it's like kind of a, it's kind of a, almost like an art typical story, you know, which is like uh, or arch typical story where it's like, you've got the uh, somebody who's down versus somebody who's up. And the person who's down is usually sincere and humble and earnest and hardworking and, and, and just, you know, and, and trying to just defend what's his or, you know, whatever. And then the person who's up and who's like the pro, you know, the antagonist or the villain is usually like this really, you know, merciless, egotistical, sneering, bullying kind of person. And then as the movie plays out, the, 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 the main character practices, works hard, develops skills, grows, and then comes out triumphantly in the end where they get to tear their shirt open and be Superman. And then in the end, they are ultra powerful and they show that, that they're the dominant one. And, and so they get exalted. And the, meanwhile, the antagonist bully gets humiliated. That's what happens. It's and that all happens up. super fast, by the way, in the movie, it happens yeah, yeah. like in a montage, you know, yeah, in, a, in a montage of running upstairs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so, and I think that that, and so that, that arc really, really appeals to people because people, what does that arc mean? Is that in that arc, the main character is always going to win. And in that arc, yeah, the main character doesn't have to deal with the sting of loss and rejection. And if they do, you're watching it, like you said, over 10 minutes and knowing that it's going to have a happy outcome right around the corner. I'm going to get the win like in 20 minutes. And so that's it, man. And so that's why, so that's interesting is that's, and people, and, and, and I think there's something else, which is like, it's, it's like, if you don't really know the path if you're not really thinking about the path of pool improvement, you could see that, oh yeah, I'm just going to, and you know what? And I've talked to you about this too, Josh. The other reason is because when people start the game, that is the path. So they start the game playing against their buddies in their basement. And what do they do? They watch a few videos, practice a little bit. Next thing you know, they play their buddies in their basement. They win all the time. So that story arc seems to be true because they, they were playing with their friends They were winning and losing. They didn't like that. So they learned some stuff and now they beat their friends all the time. And then they join an APA league and they're playing against fours and they're losing and they're getting beat and they're taking turns winning and losing. And they don't like that. So they, they watch some videos and they practice a little bit. They learn some skills and now they, now they move up to a six and they're beating all those guys. And so at a low enough level playing against weak enough competition, you can, you can actually develop your skills and it can seem like that's the, that's the nature of pool is that you just practice up and beat everybody, practice up and beat everybody. But where that breaks down is when you start playing against better and better players. Now you're not. So the difference is when you're playing against your buddies in the basement, you're running your Rocky narrative and you're playing against people that are like recreational. They're not even playing a game here. They're just hitting balls around. And when you start moving up to where your opponents are also running their Rocky narrative and they're trying to do the same thing. Now you're not playing against people that are like, you know, playing off the wall and just hitting balls and drinking beers. Now you're playing against other people that are trying to train up and beat everybody too. And when you start running into each other, there's going to be some losses some days. And so the nature of the journey changes to where the beginning of the journey, when you're playing really poor players and you're gaining skill and leaps and bounds day by day, it can create the illusion. So it's almost like people's the first two miles of the journey are like, get better, win, be awesome, get better, win, be awesome. And then right after, and so people get hooked on it. And then all of a sudden it's like the honeymoon phase of pool growth is over. 
it gets harder to get better. And you're starting to play against people that no matter how good you play, they're going to beat you sometimes. And, and that, but it's like, but then that happens for 10, 20 years and people don't realize they keep waiting for the path to go back to how it was at the beginning. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. Yep. So it's, it's, it's very strange. So, so I'm here to tell people what the path looks like and explain this so that people stop getting so frustrated because yeah. So, so I realized, cause I had a time in my life where I had like two years off pool kind of. And when I started playing again, I kind of had like this breakthrough where I look at playing pool. It's almost like if, if you had a trail in your backyard where it was like a hiking trail. And every time you went out hiking, you took the same as a three mile loop. And that loop, it like followed the same path where it's like, first you walk through open fields and then you had some uphill slog and then you went through some woods and then you had some really cool scenic outlooks. And then there was like this part where you're kind of crossing this really buggy area and it was really bad mosquitoes. And then, and then, it, and then it opened up into some really breathtaking views and a nice descent back down to where you started. Like that's the path. And every day you walk that path for five years, for 10 years, for 20 years, you walk that hiking trail every day. Well, if every day when you went out and walked that path, you like walked and all of a sudden you hit that uphill section, you're like, oh man, uphill right here. Darn it, man. I was hoping it was all going to be scenic downhill. I can't believe how this path, ah, again with the uphill, I thought this might be the day that it wasn't uphill. And then you get uphill the scenic bypass. You're like, yes, yes, this is the path I was expecting. This is nice. This is nice. I just wanted to stay like this. Now I've got this. Now I've got it. I've got it figured out. It's scenic bypass. The scenic overlooks. I got it now from here on out at scenery. Oh, darn it. There's mosquitoes. Oh, man, I thought I was done with the mosquitoes. Here's the mosquitoes again. Oh, man, I can't believe it. Like, it's just like when you look at a person that hikes the path every day and they're perpetually outraged and feeling betrayed it's difficult when it's difficult. And then they're like very fearful when things are going their way that they're like trying to convince themselves that they can cage that and keep it. And then feeling betrayed when it goes away. It's like, to me, that's, I just watched that again and again. And I watch players go through that spiral and I look at it. I'm like, guys, this is the path. You want to be a pool player. You're going to play good. You're going to play bad. You're going to win. You're going to lose. It's going to come together. It's going to fall apart. You know, you're going to hold up. You're not. It's like, you're going to make great shots and come with it. And everything's going to slow down. You're going to see the edge of the ball. And then you're going to dog the nine. I mean, like, that's it. That's all of it. Like you want to be a pool player. You are signing up for all of it and you can't control what it's going to happen or how it's going to play out. All you can control is, do you sign up for the road and keep walking or do you run from the road and hide? It, I think that again, about balance them. It's just like, it's really hard to do, but this is like something I'm working on. Like I've been working on it's a lifetime journey and I'll continue to work on it. It's like, you have to have enough grit and desire and like want to win where, where you can like find motivation and, and be that hero in that, in that montage, you know, and put in the work and, and, and succeed at times at least. Um, so it's like, it's, it's kind of like, Man, it's like there was a point in my my recent career, bro, where it's like I couldn't handle lo- like the loss. It just wasn't. I was too results focused and too tied to it, and so I like kind of zombified myself, where I just completely tried to go down the Zen path, and I just I lost a lot of fire, man. I just lost a lot of fire, and I just. But it's like I at that point in my life and my career, I needed to do that, otherwise. I was just going to like implode. Right. But it's like the balance thing that's tricky that I would try to encourage people to figure out for themselves is figure out the balance, like definitely have some fire and have that, like, this is unacceptable kind of narrative and at a percentage of your pie. And it's probably on the lower percentage of your pie, you know, and more about mastery and, and, and process is, is going to be a way bigger percentage, but like, I don't know, man. I just want to cu- go over that. And I've gone over it, I think, in the past, but I, I just wanted well, to I bring think, that up. It's yeah, like, what you're saying is is that – so so the, there's two things that don't work. The one is the white knuckle. I am a winner, and I'm going to prove that yeah. I'm a winner, and I'm going to force good results, and I'm going to demand great play for myself, and I'm going to force that I get the results I want because I'm me, and I'm going to make it happen, and that's what us winners do. 
And the problem with that, okay, is that it's that not doesn't work that way. And this this whole I'm gonna I'm gonna force you know, and especially when it leads to like if I'm not playing good, then I'm gonna whip myself and berate myself and not accept that for myself. And the way I'm gonna play good is punish myself so hard that I will know never ever ever to not play perfect because if I ever do, I'm gonna set my standards higher than anybody else, and then I'm gonna whip myself harder than anybody else for not being at that higher standard. And that's what's gonna motivate me to move forward farther than anyone else. And then I'm gonna tear my shoulder up, shirt open, be Superman, and beat everyone else. And it's like that's the narrative most people run. And it's like it's absurd when you look at like if you look at how to train dogs and if you look at how to manage employees and if you look at how to raise children or how to coach youth players, like at no time does anybody ever say set unrealistically high standards and then beat the pulp out of them for not being perfect all the time. Like that's like, you don't, I didn't have to finish that thought is so stupid. It doesn't work. It's absolutely the opposite. And so, but people think that somehow treating themselves that way is the secret. And so it's like, it's very, very frustrating to me to watch people sabotage their pool careers, suck the life out of the game, have total misery 99% of the time. And then once in a while, when they play good, then they beat their chest about how I did that because of my discipline to beat myself. It's like, no, you did that in spite of yourself. Usually when you beat yourself so hard that the egotistical part of you finally broke down, cried, surrendered, and then you happen to come together. So you did that in spite of yourself. Anyway, that's a side rant, but that's a tickle. But the bottom line is, is that, uh, what you're saying, which is that uh, it's so that doesn't work. But then the other part that doesn't work is saying, well, I'm going to just be Zen and I'm just going to be process minded and I'm just going to play to shoot beautiful shots. And I'm just going to work on, you know, I'm going to work on playing a beautiful, they talk about this in the inner game of tennis. You know, the guy is talking about how he's going to waltz around the court being wise and at peace. And it's like, no, you've got to have fire. You've got to have a, a will to win. You've got to have intensity. You've got to have like, a, an ax to grind and, a, and and something to you know a mission you've got to be on a mission that's whatever that mission a little is, chippy better, you know a yeah. little chippy not better, not overly chippy just a little chippy you so it's it's a weird thing so the balance that we're talking about is when you play you have to be on a mission and at the same time you also have to understand that there's going to be and I talk about this with the soldier and the commander. I've talked about this on my, you guys can look up coach's corner on YouTube. Uh, MN pool Boot Camp is my channel. You guys can subscribe even if you wanted to. But uh, anyway, I talk about the soldier, and the commander and about how the soldier has to be willing to fight to death. But then ultimately the commander knows that you're not going to win every battle. And that the point is that you're going to win the war, but you only win the war if the soldier's willing to fight to the death. But as long as the soldier is willing to fight to the death, if you have a few soldiers fall in battle, as long as you're going to win the war anyway. So, so, so it's about balance. Okay. So it's about balance and you can't just be waltzing around wise, but you can't be strangling results, which is where most people are. And so what happens is how do people like that, this, how do people like that handle it when they're playing bad? Let's think about the people that are trying to run the football, high school football. I'm going to will it out of, you know, I'm going to will the win and I'm going to make this happen. And this is the part where I'm going to make the three pointer at the buzzer and it's going to be slow motion. Like people that are trying to force that. What happens is when they lose, it's devastating. It hurts them because they feel like I'm a failure. If they feel like winners are people that can will a win, then people that don't will to win are failures and unacceptable. And they punish themselves because, like I said, they think it's going to motivate them and improve. So they have, so they're, every time they play, this is the day where they feel like I could fail miserably and have to punish myself and be a horrible human and a horrible failure. And, and then they're always afraid of the punishment that could come if this isn't the day that it comes together. So when they play, they're under a ton of pressure. When they play, they're under a ton of pressure because they're playing for their eternal afterlife. They're playing whether their soul is going to go to heaven or hell on whether or not they come with a shot. And they're putting so much heat on themselves by doing that, that they're, that they're just stressed, fearful, unhappy, miserable. And it's just not good. That's, that's what I see when people look at it that way. What do you think? I agree. And I've been there, man. I know from experience, I've lived that stress, miserable existence and I put all that pressure on myself and yeah, it's just, it's awful. I, uh, I remember, I don't know why I want to tell the story, but I just do it quick. It's like, I was playing someone. This was when I was at my low point, like just playing and trying to find Zen and just struggling and trying to like control everything and play, play perfect cue ball and patterns and just completely in my own way. And I was struggling and I, uh, 
I was playing a local player on a bar table, which I hate bar tables, no, no surprise. And we were gambling and I was, we were playing during a tournament. You were probably still in the tournament. I was out of the tournament or it was between matches or something. And uh, I was playing and I was struggling. Like I was completely like sitting there telling myself, why am I not like crushing this guy? I should be over this. Should, I should be running this guy over this guy, whatever, whatever. And you came up to me and you said the perfect thing right in my ear. And it was like, you come up to me and you go, why aren't you winning? <laughs> and you, were, uh, you looked like it, you were at the, you looked like you were as miserable. You're sitting there playing this worst player for money and breaking even and struggling and struggling and struggling. And I just walked up to you and said, Hey, Josh, why aren't you beating him? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Cause that's exactly what I was I, over and over and over in my head. I'm like, why am I not winning more? And I, yeah, it's just funny. It was just funny, funny, funny. So and um, I did it, I did it I just, more like a shark. Like I'm just making fun of how tough that situation is. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But at the time so, you were ready to push me in the face. Oh, totally. Totally. And it was like, I was just, that like was just haunting, you know? And it, but it's like the funniest part is like, I can look back at it now and say, gosh, man, I was just trying to struggle and like strangle results out of my game and just strangle results. And it's like, it's like either I was like, I had like, I was either hot or freezing cold. It was like, I was either trying to strangle results like, but then I was like doing it with like this, oh, I'm, I, but I need to be Zen. Like, I just can't, like, you know, it's like, I couldn't, I couldn't work the faucets, right. I couldn't get the mix. Right. It was just, it was awful, but I don't even yeah. want to know why I told that story. I just thought it was a funny story. And it's like, that's, that's like what happens when, where I'm at my low and I'm trying to strangle a result and, and trying to find the right balance and mix and just completely failing. And, and uh, you, you picked up on it and just at the right time said, the, said something that stuck with me for a long time. And it's very funny. The fact, so, yeah. Well, and, and so, so that's how, if that's how most people look at it and handle it. So then what the result is of feeling that way about competition. So you guys want to know, you want to know why that doesn't work. It's because not only do you put so much pressure on yourself that you melt down while you play, but then you actually don't want to go through that. Cause that, that process is so taxing and, and painful that what happens is people hide from real competition. And so then what they do is they become a big fish in a small pond where they're like, you know what? When I play in those situations, I melt down and I'm miserable. So that, okay, so some people quit. There's like, I, I see three paths that they can follow. Some people quit. Some, because they just don't want to go through that. Like, yeah, pool's not for me. Some people keep playing that way and they keep grinding and grinding and grinding because their their narrative is so powerful, but they're miserable 99% of the time. And, they're, and their improvement is sporadic because they're just, it's not the most effective way to play. The only thing that's effective about it is their narrative is so powerful. They keep pushing. So then they might actually achieve some level of pool success, but the, at the price of their happiness and their perpetual misery. And then the Can other thing. Can I just thing, add one thing? Yeah. Sorry, Demi. Yep. I just also want to add in, because you've mentioned it a couple of times. I want to say, my experience is it comes at the price of the people you're playing against too. Cause those people that are that way are typically not like a joy to be around or play against. Like they're pretty aggressive towards their opponents. So I just want to, I just want to say that, you know, like that, that's the other benefit of changing and fixing this stuff and trying to get better is that you're, you're better to the people you're playing with. You're a better sportsman. So that's all I wanted to add that before we kind of kept going. Sorry. Oh, for sure. For sure. And, and I'm not going to name names, but there's a lot of players that I've played that just, they don't necessarily make the world a brighter place. So, okay. So you've yeah. got the people that quit because it's too painful. You've got the people that are willing to grit their teeth through the pain, make kind of a grindy, choppy progress because of a powerful narrative, but they're too miserable to enjoy anything because it's never enough and blah, blah, blah. And then you've got the people who retire. And these are the people that become big fish in a small pond where they reach, they grind their way miserably to a point and then as soon as they feel like they've gotten far enough, they graduate themselves as good players. And now they have to protect their reputation and hide from loss and hide from pain because that excruciation, they can't, they can't handle it anymore. They don't want to handle it anymore. They're good enough to where they feel like now is the part of the story arc where I should just win all the time. And since that doesn't actually happen in real pool, what they do is they hide from real pool and they just stick to leagues where they're the best player in the league or they're the best player in their little local small pool hall. And then they just play against people they can beat where they get to just win and run that narrative that I've, I've graduated i'm a good player i win and these are the guys that i hear stuff say stuff like yeah i don't i don't get nervous i don't choke i don't feel pressure and i've always felt like when i hear that stuff like anybody that tells me they don't choke what they're really saying is they don't really play anybody that can challenge them and one of the things i'll tell everybody listening i sometimes this is actually a, a thought I, I use a replacement thought is when i ever have the thought like i'm melting down or i'm choking or i'm dogging my brains out if i ever think to myself 
well, I guess that just proves that I'm not a real player. Like, oh, I missed that nine. A, nine. a real player wouldn't have missed that, or a real player wouldn't have choked right there. A real player wouldn't be melting down like this. It's actually the opposite is true. Only a real player puts themselves in spots where they're under enough heat to break down because a lot of people can't handle it. And so they hide in safer waters where they can just guarantee a win against worse players and hide from real adversity and pressure and run a narrative that they're graduated and that they've transcended. And so, so whenever you break down melt choke, be proud of yourself because that means you're actually a real competitor and you're on the right path. Okay. So those are the three options of people that look at the game that way. And that's none of them are great. So, so here's the way I want to talk about how I actually do look at the bottom of your range and some, a couple of, uh, couple, I've got a couple anecdotes. And so I'm going to tell, I'll tell one about when I used to coach sales. Salespeople that I trained were paid commission. So they did not get up a fixed salary. They got paid depending on, we'll just call it how many widgets that they sold a month, you know, uh, their production levels. And the funny part was, first of all, they all calculated their income wrong. Most, I'd say the majority of salespeople that I worked with thought that they made six figures. And the reason why is because they had a, a month where they made 8,500 and then they just multiplied that by 12. They took their best month and multiplied it by 12. And they said, yeah, I'm a six figure salesman. And it's like, no, that's not how that works. You can't just take your high water mark and then say that that's your average. And so that's a way a lot of people view their pool game. They play their best, they play their best game. They think, well, that's how I play. And then everything else they either have to like dismiss or make excuses for, or just be like shrug. I don't know what happened there. I've got a bad night's sleep. You know, it's like, uh, anyway. So, so what I always train salespeople is like when salespeople, let's, let's say that the average was 10 widgets a month and some months they did five widgets and some months they did 15 and their best month ever, they did 18 widgets. They made a bunch of money. So as that salesperson is setting goals for their next year's income, most salespeople would be focused on finding ways to make their best month 20 instead of 18. And without fail, the best way, if they really wanted to increase their bottom line income, the best way to do that was to shore up some of the bad months that were bringing their average way down. So it's like, okay, why, why are we focused on this one month out of the year? And like, listen, you go from 18 to 20 on your best month. That's two additional widgets over the year. Divide that by 12. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's a 0.16 something increase on per average widget. You just went from an average of 10 to an average of 10.16. Good for you. If what you're looking for is a 1% increase, that'll get you there. But what about, what about, how come we had those two months where you did five and six? And what about those three months where you did seven, eight, and nine? What about what happened there? And you want to know what happened there? Is that they had in the month, the month is four weeks and a couple of days change. And what happens is when people have, this is in sales, when people have a great first week, you know, they're trying to track three widgets a month, three widgets a week gets you to 12, 13. So they're trying to hit three widgets a week. They have a they have a, a week where they do five widgets the first week and three the second. And now they're at eight and they know that they're going to hit their goals on week three and then they're going to be free rolling and they have a chance for a big, big month. So they get excited because they're off to a good start and then they pile on. But what happens is when the first week they only have one widget or zero and then the second week they're at like two and they know that even if they have a great performance the second half, it's still going to be a mediocre month. And at that point, the difference between like rallying really, really, really hard to have a mediocre month doesn't sound that attractive. I mean, they're at two by the end of the second week. Like what? I'm going to rally really, really, really hard, have a three to four widget week, and then end up at nine. <laughs> so they just kind of write that month off and they're frustrated. They're like, I'll just wait till next month because this month is going to suck no matter what I do. And then they end up at six. And it's like, what about those two weeks, the second half of that bad month that you wrote off? What if you had not necessarily set a record, but what if you just done a good job and finished with three and two and added five more? So you ended up at seven instead of five, or you ended up at nine instead of six. If you did that, because you had four or five bad months last year where you were well below your average. And if you could have improved two to three widgets, five of those months, or, you know, now, now that's uh 13. Now it's 12 widgets more. Now you went from an average of 10 to an average of 11. 
So instead of going from 10 to 10.1, you actually went from 10 to 11 as your average. And the resilience and the training and the discipline that you put in by staying engaged and working hard on all of those average months trickles over and leads to better habits on average, and it lifts your average game and your effective game, and some of your good months are going to get a little bit better too. I mean, you might end up going from 10 to 12, which in sales, that's not a 20% increase because they have bonuses, different plans. That might be a range that goes from, you know, uh, that might be a 40% increase in income. And then when you look at expendable income and the fact that you've already paid all your bills, and so any additional income is actually yours to keep, and that you might be going from having $500 of expendable income a month to having $2,000 of expendable income a month, it might be a 400% increase in your actual money in your pocket. And like legitimately from working on your bad game. So anyway, that I, I, I didn't mean to even go that far into it. I got kind of carried away. But like, this is the kind of thing that for salespeople, uh, I would have to train on. And it Without fail, if people wanted to hit their financial goals, move up, be promoted, be considered good performers, it was about how they manage their bad game. It was about how they fill the holes in their game, how they stay engaged when things aren't going their way. And without fail, that was where that was where they could hit their career goals. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yep. And so then how does, when the, you're, uh, uh, how does that compare to you? I was just going to ask you, how does that tie into pool? But go ahead. What were you going to say? Well, yeah, I mean, it's just like building the habits, right? Like pool is all about habits and, and, and mastery is about habits. And so like being like, again, like being process minded and, and looking at it instead of being results focused when things are not going well, just continue to look at it as an opportunity to train on the low end of your range and say, how can I make this not as bad? You know, how do I keep from getting absolutely destroyed? Is there something that I can do, a shot I can come with? A, a, a safety I can play. Um, so, so, okay, so like when I'm playing and I'm competing, Demi, and, and things aren't going the way I want them, i.e. results, results, and, and I'm struggling and, and there's things going wrong, like one of the things I've been doing is trying to just focus on the task at hand and say, no matter what shot I get, even even though like I'm not like a huge like one pocket guy, you know, like moving guy, I'm, I'm more of a like put them in the hole, let's, let's run out open racks. But like if I'm in a situation where things are stuck in the mud and I'm in a moving game and balls are breaking tough and I'm not able to like, you know, have things go the way I think that I want them to go. So I start feeling frustrated and I get to the low end of my range all of a sudden. It's like one thing I've been doing is really focusing on saying, you know what, in this moment, like I'm a pool player and I have a full range of things that I need to do as a pool player. If, if the moving game is what I'm going to do right now, if all I'm going to get is a kick off this guy, because I also play good players, you know, like, like Brian Brecky's stingy, man, that guy plays really good safeties. I play a lot with him. And it's like, if, if all I get is a kick off the guy, I got to try to like, and I'm frustrated and I'm at the low end of my range in my mind, I have to like figure out a way to work on my process and just come with a good kick or try to lay a good safety or, or a move or, you know what I'm saying, Dan? Yeah, 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 and and I, I, and again, there's a if we get into the conversation, and I'm not like right, I wish you had said that. I'm just saying I can't go down the road of how to handle playing at your bad end of your range because oh, yeah, that's, yeah, gotcha. that's such a big conversation that that that's a whole another conversation. But but the but the main thing is to understand that for every situation that what I what I would say is this: I'm not going to allow playing badly and not having things go my way to bully me off doing my job. I have a job to do, which is to give, you know, make my, it's, it's my job is to manage my processes. I can't control my results, but I can control my processes. So that means I can make a good decision on every shot. I can make, I can put in a good effort on every shot. I can, I can take a deep breath and go through my pre-shot and commit to my shot. I can put a good swing on my cue stick and I can manage my attitude as best I can. Now, when you're playing bad, it is so easy to not hold yourself accountable and just be like, this doesn't count. I'm throwing this one away. I'm not going to, I'm just going to throw away today and just not add it on my score sheet. Today doesn't matter. Today, I, th today doesn't matter. Everything's bad. I don't care. I don't even care anymore. I, I don't want to play. Screw you guys. I'm going home. And it's like, that's not, you don't get to do that. When you're, if you're a real pool player, you don't get to do that. Everything you do counts. Everything you do matters. And so when you're, you don't excuse yourself. You hold yourself accountable. And that doesn't mean you're going to play good, but it means you don't have permission 
it would be like if you have a business, would you want an employee that showed up and when they felt like working, they worked and when they were they having a bad day, they just didn't answer the phone and they didn't greet, you know, when the customer came in and asked for help, they just ignored the customer because they didn't feel like it. Like, no, you have a job to do. That's called work. You want to be a pool player. You have a job to do, which is to manage your attitude, manage your processes. And it doesn't matter. And if you're saying, well, the results aren't going to be good anyway, I'm like, I don't care about your results. I want to, you don't get to slack on your process, bro. You have to keep making good decisions. So you have to keep taking a deep breath. You have to keep putting in the effort. You don't get to skip it. So, and, and, and I, sometimes I tell people like, it's only when you're at the bottom of your range that you can improve. Like it's, you can't improve when you're at the top of your range. The only, because you're always, as long as you're trying to improve on the top of your range, and this isn't strictly true, of course, if you develop your skills, it pulls up your whole range, of course. But when you're at the bottom of your range, as long as you don't manage the bottom of your range, it will keep showing up and bringing you down. And the only chance you have to really improve as an overall competitor is it's like, you're only as good as you're only as good as your bad day. If you have an employee, it's if they treat five people nicely and then the last customer, they start a fight, you know, lose their temper with the guy. It's like, I don't care how nice you were five days of the week. I care about what you did to that customer. It's like you can't, what's the bottom of the range of your performance. And that's what we measure too. If you show up four days and, and then no call, no show the last day. Well, that's a problem. <laughs> you know, it's like it, at some point you have to manage your behavior to where the bottom of your behavior range is acceptable. And so only when you're at your worst, when you're at your worst, it's an opportunity to improve your worst. And that's what I want people to hear. There's been a lot of words. When you're at your worst, it's an opportunity to improve your worst. And it doesn't have to be good. It doesn't even, it just has to be less terrible. So that maybe yeah. instead of being good, instead of being, instead of being like somebody watches you melt down and give up and shoot a bunch of balls at a rail, shaking your head with disgust and muttering about how things are going the other person's way. And, you know, I'm sorry, I couldn't give you more challenge since I'm unhappy. I'm going to try to piss all over you and diminish your win. It's like, instead of doing that, what if they just take it on the chin and keep trying and then unscrew their cues and go home and practice? How about that? You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 for sure. For sure. Yep. And I think that's what you're saying with the sales guys. You know, it's like when you're in those bad months and you're absolutely at your worst and you feel like it's kind of helpless, you, you still got to keep grinding and still got to put in effort and still work on your process and try to raise up. Even if you don't get a result of an extra sale or two or three, it's like you have to just, that's what I was saying with the habits. You just have to be in the habit of always trying to like, you know, work your process and give your, do your best. Yeah, you got to grade yourself off your process. So, okay, I understand yep. you're grading yourself off results and giving yourself an F, but how are you grading yourself on your process right now? That's the question. And so, so I want to tell, I want to tell a, a quick story that was like the most interesting. Okay, two players, player A and player B. I didn't think of names. They were both six fifty to seven hundred Fargo rates. And they were both big, you know, they both did well in their pond and they were going to get together and play each other some $200 a set or I don't remember what it was. I actually don't remember the bet, but it was, it might've even been a hundred a set, but it was enough to where, because they were both used to winning and being good. And they were both kind of had high expectations. They both were kind of struggling a little bit with the pressure and they just played each other races to seven. And what happened was player B won four sets in a row. It was seven five, seven four, seven five, seven three. So player B won four sets. What's that? Two, four, seven, eleven. So twenty eight to seventeen. Got eleven games ahead. Overall score twenty eight to seventeen. Set score was four to zero. Player B won all four sets, won four hundred bucks or whatever. Sounds pretty decisive, right? Sounds like, yeah, player B is the better player. Player A has to get a spot, whatever. Well, I watched that match. And here's what I have to say. That 11-game deficit, that 4-0 to zero set, player A was, in my opinion, one shot away from winning the session. And to me, this is a mind, this is mind-blowing of how pool can work. And the reason why is because what, how it played out, I was watching very closely. I found this, I, I know both these people, you know, casual friends with both of them. I like both of them. Player A, they both were under pressure the first set. 
and player A was spewing opportunities and struggling to run out and hooking themselves and missing money balls. And that's fine. That's fine. Because notice, why is that fine? It's because that's results. And player A, that's not what I'm holding player A accountable to. If I'm player A's coach, I'm like, yeah, well, you're nervous. You're going to miss money balls. You're going to die some shots. You're going to hook yourself. Your speed's going to be off. You're not going to be settled in. You're going to have a hard time shifting the baton from planter to shooter. I get it. I've been there. No problem. I'm not grading him on results. I'm grading him on process. So far, so good. He's trying. But he lost the first set. But then the second set is the one that got me. Because in the second set, he lost seven to five. But the thing is, he missed, it was player playing nine ball. He missed like two nine balls and an eight ball and fumbled some other pretty routine opportunities. And the problem I had was watching that, those errors, some of them were, he gave his best and it didn't work. But I'm watching really close. And on a few of them, he didn't really give it his best effort. He didn't really give it his full process. It's like he was in such a nightmarish, snake bit, miserable, embarrassed, humiliated, choke bag that just such a melt. He was in such a meltdown spot that it was too painful for him to stay in the present and go through that. So he started kind of like, kind of like Eddie and the hustler when he's drinking and like kind of like checked out. He's like, and Minnesota comes back and, you know, after having him, you know, after having him stuck 17 K he starts like getting drunk and just kind of like out of body experience nightmare, watching the guy come back and beat him. He's like, he's, he has to check out because he can't even go through all that. And it's like, it's like, that's what he looked like. He looked like he was checked out, like he couldn't stay in the present and, and go through that and fight. He had to like zombie walk around and act like he was just like, he had to like disengage from the situation because it was too painful. And as a result, he started cutting his process, not putting in best effort and kind of like, it doesn't matter anymore what I do. Cause it's so bad. It doesn't even matter. Like don't even mark my games. I don't care anymore. It was like, it was so painful that he had to go in. I don't care anymore, Matt boy. And, and here's the problem, Josh, he was up five to four. And he missed his third money ball for the set or the second money ball it was the third eight, nine. He had an eight ball. He missed, he missed two nines and he missed his third nine ball. And he was an, I don't care anymore. Board up five to four, but he wasn't mad about the score. He was mad about how bad he was playing and how humiliated he was and how frustrated he was that he was so snake bit. And all I could think, all I could think was this. Had he stayed in the present, taking deep breaths, understand that this is just the part of the road that goes to the mosquito village or whatever. And that like, had he found a way to just keep giving an effort and keep composed and just understand that, yes, I'm playing bad, but it's my job to keep doing my processes and give things a chance to turn around. And I'm grading myself off my effort and my decision-making and, and just hang in there. Had he missed one less money ball, he may have won that set seven, five. And his opponent may have dogged something. If you know, if he gets up six to four, maybe his opponent dogs something because now his opponent's feeling pressure. And then he wins seven to five. So let's just pretend he missed one less money ball, and he all of a sudden he wins that set seven five. Now he takes his bathroom break, and the clouds lift, and he realizes I have literally played the worst pool I can play for two sets here for two and a half hours, and I'm even with the guy. If this guy can't beat me when I'm playing my absolute worst, and I just, now like. I got to like my end of it and it can't get any worse and I'm doing fine. So it can only get better. And I just want to set and all of a sudden the cloud lifts and then he starts loosening up and he starts playing better. And now he goes on and wins the next two sets and the other guy quits. And so when I looked at that match with the 28 to 17 score differential and the four sets to zero, all I saw was a guy that could have kept calm and made one more ball and won the day. And that stuck with me. Were you there that day? Do you know who I'm talking about? Demi, I've listened to the story and I'm like, this, who did I lose to? Who, who did I do this to? <laughs> who got me? I have the whole time I'm thinking, I'm like cringing and I'm thinking, oh, I hope this isn't me. No, it's not you. It's not you. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Because I'm like, I've done. I've done. And I'm like, I would have paid you $200 to not tell that story if it was me. So, no, I just no, give you half on, your man. money back. No, no, I know, I know, I know. I just, I, uh, so I don't, I mean, I, I hear you, bro. And it's like, I, and you know, even though I'm joking, like you're probably, I thought it was me, like, you know, you know, deep down, I was like, Oh girl, like I've, you know, whatever. I, uh, I understand that part of pool and I understand how critical it is. And, you know, you got to fight through it, but, uh, 
yeah i don't i don't remember i don't remember watching that i don't remember i guess you have to tell me after who it was and i'll remember yeah yeah but. so any anyway but one thing that you have seen and this was like my last i had some notes of things i wanted to make sure i covered and the last part of it was like derby like the last pro tournament we went to, to together to uh was before covid was that derby of 2020 and you and one of our mutual acquaintances that was out there was uh you guys were watching me play a match and it's race to nine and i'm playing some guy that's like 100 fargo points worse than me but i'm totally snake bit and absolutely nervous because it's like expectation and i'm trying to play good and i you know you guys are watching i, I don't want to let you down i want to prove to myself and i want to beat this guy and i just want to make sure i've I'm, I'm, I'm several rounds in and I, if i can win this match then i'm even another round in and i want to make this my good tournament and i was just very results focused and i was playing very poorly and very snake bit and very controlly and it wasn't good but what happened was it went like six six in a race to nine and the, the only thing is i'm not i'm not proud of how i played or how controlling and results oriented I was. What I'm proud about is how well I managed through that because I have been down this road so many times that when I get that way, I don't panic. I'm just like, yeah, I've been here before and I'll be here again. And so what ended up happening was I, I calmly, I just, I didn't let it rattle me so that I got through that. I ended up winning nine to seven. I smoothed out and played a couple of good racks and got it done. And then I, I kind of ground through the next set the same way where it was a little patchy. And then towards the end of the set, I smoothed out and got it done. And it was frustrating because I wanted to play better. Trust me. But that's just where I was at the time. So I did what I, I did what I did when I was there. And then the weight lifted. And then I played John Mora and, and caught a gear. And you saw that, that I was just freewheeling, prancing around the table, freewheeling on the guy and running out from everywhere. And then I played uh, and I got past that. And then I played that uh, Danny Smith. And <laughs> and I'm down like four to one and he forfeit. It was the weirdest. Anyway, it doesn't matter. The point is not like, oh, look at me. The point is this. You don't get a chance. I would never have had those two sets where I ended up taking like 20th or whatever out of however many players, four or 500 players. It's like I never would have had that finish if I had lost, if I had lost by cool and playing badly. And so, and I remember something Mike Davis said, he's a, you know, top American pro or whatever. He, he said he's won like 50 pretty good sized tournaments, like regional size events, like seminal events and stuff like that. He says he's won 50 good size, you know, state championship type stuff. He's won 50 tournaments in his life. And he says, maybe one of them, or maybe possibly two of them at the most. He's just like gone there, played great the whole way through and earned it. Like, you know, just completely just ran the field over. He says 48 of his tournament wins, he was like struggling and choking and dogging it and getting lucky because somebody missed a money ball back. Like he'd dog it on the hill and they'd dog it back and he'd get one back or he'd get a roll when he needed it or just he'd have a couple matches in there that he didn't have to win. And then he'd get through that and then smooth out and catch a gear and some good things would happen. And so he's like 48 out of 50. He didn't like go in there and just wade through the field like Superman. He just did what he had to do and things went his way and he which which means that he had a lot a lot of tournaments he lost of course he had a lot of losses along the road which is part of the story but the point is is that you know he couldn't have won 48 of his 50 tournaments he couldn't have won if every time he was nervous and playing bad he mentally resigned and so i just i just wanted to kind of share that story and talk a little bit about when we're at the bottom of our range that it's if i could recap the whole conversation i'd say if you're going to be a real pool player that means you're signing up for a journey, which is not practice up, get good, and never win, and never lose, and never play bad. You're signing up for a journey, which involves good times, bad times, wins and losses. And that, and that, if you're a competitor, that means you take that on, you embrace it. And that actually, the fastest road to greatness is right through the the pain and the difficulty between you and that 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 destination. And that a big part of how how fast you're going to get to the top and how well you're going to manage through bad times is how you look at that. How do you, what does it mean when you go through bad times? And when you just look at it as a, a part of the game and a part of the game that you have to manage and, and that you can accept and that you can even look at it as some joy. Like, Hey, when I'm at the bottom of my range, I know I handle the bottom of my range better than most players handle the bottom of theirs. And that gives me an edge over my competition. It does. I actually look at it like now's my chance to get an edge over my competition because most of y'all forfeit when you're playing bad and I don't forfeit. So that means, I, yeah, you may beat me when you're playing good and I'm playing bad and I'm going to beat you when I'm playing good and you're playing bad. But on average, 
my average is going to be better because I don't give up half the time. So there. So it's like, I actually look at it like now's my chance to get an edge on my competition. So having it, welcoming the bottom part of your range, integrating it, it's not that you have a good part of you and a bad part of you. And if only I could just fire the bad part of me and make the good part of me. And how do I get rid of this other guy? It's like, no, no, no. You are you. You own all of it. So you own all of it. So go. That's what I'd have to say about that topic. So that's what was and on I, my heart just, t- Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was yeah, on my heart no, that's week. awesome. That's awesome. Um, I would just tack on the end for practice, Demi, because this is something I experienced this week, is the bottom of my range where I'm practicing. And I kind of came up with a similar like look on it, which is that's not going to keep me from from hitting by volume numbers just because I'm mm. at the bottom of my range. Like it's not going to keep me, it's not going to like the, like, I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to unscrew. I'm not going to stop playing and I'm not going to like beat myself up and tell myself it's never going to work. And I just, it's like, you don't mean volume, volume, volume. I just, I, I feel like you have to be able to practice through the bottom of your range and not get into this in your own head where you, um, start thinking, well, I mean, I'm so screwed up right now that this is just not going to be helpful. I'm just going to build bad habits. It's like, no, I don't think so. Like my, my thought is keep fighting, keep trying to like be process minded, even when you're practicing and process mind through the bottom of that range of when you're practicing. Cause I'm realizing, cause I, I mark all my games and I look at them and I look at my scores and I realize, wow, I'm at the bottom of my range right now. And, uh, I can't, let that keep me from practicing and I can't let it shark me and, and, and run some sort of negative narrative where it's never going to work and it's never going to get there. And so what happened was for me, I was playing two days in a row where I was really towards the bottom of my range. And then uh, I was able to play another player and adrenaline got in there and I just absolutely was just full fire. You know, I mean, I was at the absolute peak of my range, like, oh, like within the flip of a coin, basically, you know? So I just, my experience is the rail. As soon as you put those coins on the head rail, it all turns around. No, 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 no. It's nothing like that. It's just, it's just, ha- it, it's just like, it, it, I, I'm not, yeah, exactly. Like, no, it's no, not, I, that's I wasn't, an, I wasn't it didn't have to work that way. Yeah. I wasn't yeah. making funny. Oh, just, okay. Okay. I thought you were saying like, oh, saying, as soon as you, you bet something and I'm, you know, on no, my no, ring. No, I'm just saying, no, it's just, it, but the opposite. It's so many times you're one shot away from everything turning around and you never know which is the shot. You And here's what I would say. It's, I was talking to you about this because we've actually had some offline talks and I was ranting about the yellow brick road. So for those people that don't like weird, elusive, like, you know, kind of out there references, you guys don't have to listen to me, but I think about the path to pool of greatness. It's like, it's the yellow brick road. It is a path that absolutely leads to the Emerald city. And the only way it's like, there's nowhere else it leads. And the only way that you don't get there, there's, and there's, there's goblins and ghosts and witches that can try to all they, they can't touch you. Here's the rules of your pool journey. Those goblins and demons and witches, they can't touch you. They can't block the road. They can't hurt you from going down the road. They can't physically impede you in any way from traveling down the road and getting to Oz. All they can do is try to spook you from going down the road. And they can tell you things like you're going the wrong way. You're never going to get there. If you aren't there by now, you never will. You don't have the resources to put in. You know, so-and-so, I mean, look at how bad. You just missed that ball. That's proof that you'll never get there. This is probably the wrong road anyway. All these little whispers. And if you, if you listen to those whispers and then stop moving your feet, then you won't get there. And so, and so and the beautiful part to what you're saying about the good and bad part of your range is the very beginning steps of the yellow brick road. It's like a little spiral. You remember Dorothy, the thing she did the bunch kids. Anyway, so she's on this little spiral, which means that she's taking steps away from Oz and then towards Oz and away from Oz. Like the road there is not like this direct linear path where every session you play is incrementally better, better. That's what makes it challenging is that it goes forward and back and up and down. And so if every time, the, every time that yellow brick road takes a little turn, you're like, Oh, I don't know if this is the right path anymore. And then you sit down and, and cry for an hour that you might be lost. It's like, well, that's what it's like. If every time you're, that's what to tie it back to what you're saying. If every time you're practicing and you have a bad day, you're like, well, who am I kidding? I'm never going to get there anyway. Why bother practicing? It just, that's, you're not going to beat a guy that's just like day in, day out. I'm going to do what I need to do and trust that I'm on the right road. And, and so you can't, you can't do that. You can't, you, like I said, you have to hold yourself accountable to your process. And so 
that's a process goal is how much you put in, in terms of input and practice. And if you have a certain amount of time that you commit to, then you got to put that in regardless if you feel like it. And regardless if you feel like you see direct tangible evidence that this is immediately going to pay off. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and, and same with, uh, yeah, I, I kind of lost my thread. I was thinking about the yellow brick road again and, uh, and just all, all the things that go in it, but okay. I think we've, covered that pretty that's what was on my heart to speak about i just know a lot of people that feel like they want to kill half themselves it's like they i have a lot of people that are like i play good then i play bad and i don't get it and if i could just get rid of the other guy then i'd be a champion and it's like no nope you have to integrate all of this and then own all of it and then manage all of it and and just embrace all of it you can't be you know multiple personalities here um i won't make any ex wife jokes <laughs> okay uh, all right so yeah. we'll just move on we'll just move on with that so that's um that's my pod for the day. I we covered what I wanted to cover and some of the listener questions. And Josh, I'll let you pick our next topic. So if there's something burning on your heart, uh, and if anybody else has listener questions uh, or would like information on training one on one, not stroking into a coke bottle, not watching trick shots and hearing road stories. Although, I mean, you know, within reason, I I, I have a couple of cool shots. But uh, but the main but but actually breaking down your pool game for three days with a super passionate, super engaged person that's in your corner. Either way, questions or lesson inquiries, reach out to me at info at mnpoolbootcamp.com. And uh, we'll, uh, if you have a good letter or any feedback on the podcast or questions, we'll, uh, we'll review that together next ep. Yeah, yeah. Are we doing road stories? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I forgot. One yeah. for the road. I forgot about the road. One story. for the road, bro. One for the road. One, Come one on. One for the road. Okay. Uh, well, I actually forgot entirely about that, so I don't, I'll don't. i have to just grab what I read. But what's your road story for the week, Josh? Hit me with the road story. Okay, so I just want to tell a funny story about that. I mean, this is like, like a mini funny story. This is quick. So we're out, in, we're out at Red Shoes, and we're playing a nine-ball tournament. So we drive all the way out there, and we're playing a nine-ball tournament. And it's early in the tournament, right? It's super early in the tournament. And I look over – and Demi is playing a guy and the guy is very results focused. I mean, he's very like agro. He's very like, you know, like heavy, heavy narrative going. Like he's just kind of like oozing and sort of like, like a tuning fork, right? He's just really tense and just, and kind of like, kind of a guy that's just difficult to play. And I look over and the guy breaks the ball and he scratches. And the one nine is absolutely wired. It just, it just cannot be missed. It's just wired in there. And, uh, Demi, I'm watching him from like 30 feet, 20 feet away. And Demi picks up the cue ball and he, and he walks over to the table and he starts studying the run out. Like he's looking at the run out and he's just, he's just like acting like he, like spoiler, he's acting like he doesn't see the one nine. And you can kind of see the guy like fidgeting in his chair and getting kind of excited because it's like, oh, the guy's going to try to run out and the table is kind of tough. And all of a sudden Demi like stops what he's doing and he completely resets and he holds his hand like three feet over the table, like a, like one of those kids crane games at the, you know, and he drops it like a crane and it goes pop, pop, pop. And then he slams in the one nine and, and wins the game. And it was just like, it was this, this awesome, funny, funny troll thing. And so I, don't it was know, a, I just it thought was that a was a slow, funny story. It was a slow roll. And I will tell people, Epic slow roll. this is the only time I've ever done that. I've never done that before. And I'll probably never do it again. This guy was just doing something that just was so unbearable and unpleasant that I just, for some reason, I just felt like putting him through the, the grinder. I just wanted to grind him in his chair for a minute. So the one <laughs> nine, it wasn't, un, it wasn't dead. Like they weren't touching each other. There was like a foot of space, but the nine ball was like six or eight inches from the hole. And the one's like a foot and a half away. Like, it's like a 95 percent one nine combo and i knew as soon as he scratched i may have had nine but the point was I, I got down i put the cue ball down like i was going to shoot the one in the corner and then i started looking at where i wanted to be on the two and i got down on the shot that i got off the shot and moved the cue ball an inch and then studied again and of course the whole time he's just like hurry up and shoot that in so i'm safe from you riding the nine and then i i did this for like <laughs> it was probably like 60 70 seconds but it probably must have felt like an hour to him and then as soon and then i just kind of got down i was looking at the two and then i did this thing where i like looked over and like pretended like i was just noticing the nine and then yeah i just <laughs> just swung around pivoted and just wire the thing <laughs> so i just the guy the guy somebody needed to do it to the guy so okay i'm not proud of that moment but it was very funny you could edit that out if you want to I me mean, but that that was just a funny one off the top of my head all right and how did yeah. uh how did that tournament end up anyway did uh, oh uh, oh come on now yeah 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 you that, that was that was a cool one you got in the finals and uh 
Beat Sergio in the finals. That was yeah, awesome. And you got third. You were there with me. That was the one where I met. Yeah, Bert. yeah. That was the one where I met Bert Guinness there. And he said, "Killing machine, little he killing says, machine." He said, "Looks like all the money's going back to Minnesota." Anyway, that was a <laughs> okay. So then, yeah, yeah. So then, my story is a story about you, Mister <laughs> Mister Prospect. He, uh, Mister Prospect. We were in Las Vegas at the Q Club, and uh, we were looking for a money game, and so we're like practicing nine ball, and it's like it's hard, but there's like a pro tournament in town, and the place is crawling with like top players. You can get a game. But if you just go there, like, if you're not, like, in, like, some pro tournament and you just go to a pool hall, it's just like any other pool hall. It's, like, it's hard to get action if you're from out of town and stuff. And so so we're trying to get action. We're asking around, and nobody wants to play. And so we're just kind of practicing some kicks and stuff. And anyway, you're like, okay, man, let's go. Let's go. And I'm like, hey, I still want to try to get a game. You're like, no, man, we've asked everybody. Nobody's going to play. So I said, tell you what. Here's what we're going to do. Before we go, we're going to play one rack of one pocket. I said, if we rack up the balls and play one rack of one pocket, like maybe that'll get like some interest. Like maybe somebody will see us playing some really bad one. And not that we're going to stall, but just like maybe if we play a game of one pocket, like somebody will like come out of the woodwork on us. So you're like, all right, we'll play one rack of one pocket that we're out of here. So I rack the balls up and we start hitting and we're about what? Like legitimately like four innings in. Two, this two shots in. Yeah, two, three like, shots, two yeah, shots. Yeah, barely in. at all. And some guy comes, wa- you know, sidewalking on up to us, like, you know, straddling on over. And he's like, you guys play one pocket? And he's like, you know, <laughs> would one of you guys want to play a little one pocket? And it was just this, like, everything slowed down. I'm like, yeah, you know, I play you some. So I end up playing the guy. So this is like a two-parter. So the first part was like, I, it, it's just, it's like, I, I willed it out of the ether. It's like, I just, it was I the sickest, you. it was the sickest read and sickest play in the world. Yeah. It was super funny. <laughs> rack, rack up the up balls and then somebody else. It's it. some sort of like moving artist, old school. I mean, everyone in there was like over 62 practically. It's like, it was just like a bunch of like ball bunting moving guys. And it's like, Demi's like, let's just rack up a game of one pocket and watch what happens. And it was like, it was like super, super funny. That just a guy like materializes out of nowhere and like wants to play 50 a rack one pocket. Yeah. So, so we, I, so I play the guy some 50 a rack and we rack up and here's the, here's the capper to it. <laughs> so Josh, Josh is sitting, they have this like overview of good rig for the rig table. And so Josh is sitting on the rail and like two or three other guys come and sit down next to, to watch. And Josh you turn to the guy next to you and what you were op- and you open your mouth to make a comment. And the comment you were going to make was you were, you looked at me and you looked at the guy I was playing and you were turning to the guy watching and you were about to say, that guy has no chance. <laughs> and, and so you open your mouth to say that guy has no chance. And you caught yourself and you're like, what am I doing? And you, and it's and right as you're about to say it, you, you change, you take a breath and you go, do you want a side bet? And the guy, <laughs> and the guy's like, yeah, I'll take that guy for 20 a rack. And you're like, Oh, okay. So we, so the next thing you know, like I ended up winning four games in a row. The guy quit. And then you got us a little extra something because I just thought that yeah. was hilarious. Like you were just like, literally unbe- you were just like surprised that we got, that we got the action and you're like, man, we're stealing. Like that guy has no chance. And he turned and, and then pivoted at the last second and got a side side bet on the guy <laughs> that was funny yeah that was awesome i just remembered like my brain right when i like right before i spit the words out i was able to self-correct and get us some action but i was just like literally gonna nudge the guy like he is drawing dead watch this this is gonna be a bloodletting and it's like i just stopped myself it was yeah. funny 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 and the guy I played played oh, okay, and he wasn't, you know, he was he was, you know, my age, and he played a decent game, but it's just whatever, it doesn't matter. So anyway, a couple of funny road stories, just so yeah. many people out of the uh, out of thin air to play. All you got to do is rack up some one pocket, and somebody will appear and play. You yeah, that's a good rack. that's a good tip for all the all the <laughs> all the, the up and coming young players out there that are looking for action. Just rack up some one pocket, and you'll get some ball bunter to come over. And the guy played good too. So, I mean, you just played better one pocket, so yeah, it's cool. Yeah, or you could do what Corey Duell does. You, you know, back when he was on the road, you walk in and just tell everybody that, you know, you play really, really good and you learn from your uncle and he can make the eight on the break every time. He said that. Yeah, uh, that is a that is a great move. That's a great story. So yeah. that's tips on how to get action. A little bonus content for you uh, aspiring players. All right, <laughs> yeah, Josh, yeah. what a great session. Cool, I hope everyone enjoyed it. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for supporting the Queue It Up Network, MN Pool Bootcamp, Demetrius Gelatis, Josh Burble. Josh, let's call it a day. All right, man. Fun, fun. Talk to you next time.